as we look to the future, as we imagine how we want to do conservation, it seems clear to me that some of our decisions have already been made for us. We can't go back. We can't leave half the world alone. There is no part of the world that we have not already irrevocably touched. Instead, we have to think about the future. If we want to live in a world that is both biodiverse and filled with people, and I think we want that world, where we can reduce human suffering and animal suffering, where we can help stop the extinction crisis, where we can do more with the resources that we have, then we do have to choose. Whether that means getting your hands dirty by going and helping to pull invasive water hyacinths out of the streams and rivers in your backyard, and they are there, I promise you, or adding your name to the list of those ready to receive and plant a GMO American chestnut tree. I know I am, I don't really live in the right part of the world and I guess neither do most of you, but maybe we can plant other trees or genetically modified trees or just engaging in conversations with our friends and our family and maybe even with people in the powerful political elite about the potential of genetic engineering technologies to solve some of the crises that we are facing today. Clearly, there are risks associated with these technologies that we will need to learn to evaluate, to mitigate, to deal with in some way. And maybe we will make decisions not to use some of these technologies. But there is a far greater risk, I feel, in shying away from these technologies because we don't yet understand them than there is in allowing them to mature. If we want to avoid a future where there are more headlines like these, and we have to choose to meddle better. Thank you for your attention. And I will stop sharing and uh, turn off my screen. Perfect timing, I would like to say. That was great because I have never given that talk before. So I'm thrilled that it is exactly 45 minutes long as it was supposed to be. <laughs> Beth, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I love how you've not practiced it before and yet it's flawless and so lively and I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. If, I have to say, if anyone's got any questions, please send them in. We've got lots coming in already, but it's nice to hear them. And if you missed it at the beginning, I've put a link in the chat box, which is where you can buy Beth's fantastic book and learn more about this. Um, it came out today in the UK. It's my public day. Day. Um, got some day. I've got some questions, got questions already. Um, one's from Georgina and she wants to know, um, you said you did your PhD at Oxford, but she was wondering how you got into this, this niche and what drew you to evolutionary biology, a bit more about your own personal relationship with the topic. You know, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's an interesting question. I, I, I was kind of a precocious kid. I grew up in Georgia, in the southeastern U.S., and I changed my mind about what I wanted to be when I grew up a lot. Um, I went as an undergraduate to the University of Georgia because they have a great journalism school and I wanted to be a broadcast journalist. And the summer of my freshman year at college, um, at university, I took a class that was a geology and anthropology class. And we, we started off on the East Coast of the US and we drove across the country, sleeping in national parks and learning about the deep history and recent history of our planet and all of the ways that uh, first the ice ages impacted things and then later that people when when people first appeared in North America impacted the landscapes and as I was doing that taking that class I thought wow this is super cool I should be a science journalist rather than a regular journalist um, and I kind of I'd been working at, at the at the radio station and at a tv station where I was when I was younger and I thought I kind of know how to be a journalist but I had known nothing about science so maybe I will just take some science classes and so I started taking science classes and I really liked it and I started to travel and I got to go live in Panama for a bit where I I I, I worked on uh, how changes in rainfall patterns were impacting tropical rainforests which was really cool and um, I decided then that what I wanted to do was work with a specific person that I had met while I was in Panama who had this fascinating program that he was just about to start at Edinburgh. And um, we designed this whole project I was gonna do and I was too poor to be an international student at Edinburgh. So I started applying for all sorts of scholarships that I could get to go and be a student in the UK. 
And the one that I needed was called a Marshall scholarship because that would allow me to choose where I would go and I would go to Edinburgh. And I did not even get a first round interview <laughs> for the Marshall scholarship, but I ended up winning a Rhodes scholarship, which took me to Oxford. And so I showed up at Oxford, wandering around my first day and just wondering, feeling sorry for myself, but also excited and intimidated <laughs> and wondering what I would do when I met this Kiwi, um, Alan Cooper, who had just also turned up at Oxford. And I said, you know, I, I, I have funding for a PhD, but I don't know what I want to do. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, I'm just starting up a lab and I don't have any students. And if you, if you join my lab, then you can go to Siberia. And I thought, hmm, that's a good reason as anything to, to take this PhD. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he was actually working in this new field, ancient DNA, which I'd never heard of. In fact, I'd never done any molecular biology, but I was immediately impressed that you could take an old thing like a mammoth bone or a bison bone or horse bone and extract DNA from that thing and use that to learn how populations grew and shrank and move across space because of these big tumultuous changes like the ice age or the introduction of human predators into their habitat. And I was hooked, right? So I started working in ancient DNA. And then, as I said, as I began this talk, whenever you published a paper, I was always excited to talk to people about the implications of my research for learning about how populations and species and ecosystems respond to tumultuous change and how we could apply that to helping to protect endangered species and places today. But they only ever wanted to know what my findings meant about how close we were to bringing mammoths back to life. And I'm not kidding about that. That, is not, just, that was it. And so I, I wrote my first book, which was called How to Clone a Mammoth. This one was published about 15 years ago. I did a how-to academy with exactly this title then, and, um, which was fun. Great time. I had a great time going around and talking to people about the technologies, which has really kind of sucked me into thinking about we can't clone mammoths. We can't really bring them back yet. But what can we use these technologies to do? Um, so then I thought, well, my last book was kind of fun. My husband says that I did not think it was fun at the time, by the way. But I, it's like childbirth. You only remember the good stuff afterward, <laughs> which is what you do again. And so I, I wrote the second book, which um, is, I, I really enjoy. I think it's, it was way more fun to write. It's really it's about ancient DNA and in the beginning about how we've learned, how we as a species have impacted other species, things like extinctions and domestication and conservation, but then moves into how we might use these same technologies in the future. So it's a long answer, but that is my trajectory that includes everything about my, my scientific career and my, my career, I guess, as a, as a science writer. I'm back to full circle now. <laughs> so writer. really, in short, it began <laughs> with the holidays and then turned into a passion. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to get to Siberia. Um, <laughs> we've got a great question from Vicky, actually, um, which is sort of interesting to see your response um, because you're, from what I understand, your your book is arguing that it's important to look at the history of how humans have intervened in this to see how we need to change things for the future as well. And she essentially asks, um, how do you deal with people who have problems with the the idea of the ethics of intervening in science and animals and plants yeah it's a you know it's a it's a great question and a really good point and the reason that i like to to hearken back to the past is is because the, it's it's almost as if that ethical conundrum has we don't have a choice in this you know we have been intervening when we found gray wolves and we turned them into chihuahuas and great danes that we were intervening you know the the choice to intervene and to drive the evolution of the plants and animals that we interact with has already been made by our ancestors long ago and you know we, we often like to think of conservation as the opposite of this as being non-intervention we are leaving things alone we are gonna just wall off some space and let that happen but that is actually not how conservation works at all you know it, we decide when we're choosing to protect a species which individuals get to reproduce, where they get to live, how big their populations get to be. As I said, we, we vaccinate them, we fence them off, we protect them. We are causing them to evolve in a way that makes them best fit to live in a world with us, which again is us intervening. But there is a good question then about 
the, the difference between sort of intentionally pushing things along one evolutionary path and going and using gene editing, potentially like in the black-footed ferret example, to move DNA from one species to another. That we might be able to do it by just breeding them. But the argument there is that this process is just too slow. You know, the, the pace of change in habitats today is because of us is way faster than traditional evolution by natural selection can keep up. Think about the, the cattle example. We could create hornless milk cows by breeding an Angus bull with a Holstein cow and then back breeding that animal for many, many generations back into Holsteins to eventually get back to that perfect milk producing animal. But it would take decades to do that and the farmer would be losing money and there are all of that. And we, we, we wouldn't have the benefits of the, the decades of really concerted breeding to get perfect Holsteins. We would lose that right away. But we would get it immediately in one generation by using this tool to transfer DNA between breeds of cattle. This could be something that, in fact, you know, and I, this is important to say because when we have these conversations, um, it's important to know the difference between these things. Um, this creates what's known as cisgenic organisms. So there's a difference between cisgenic, meaning the DNA is moved, but it, it comes from comes from the same breed or the same species. It could have happened in nature if we had enough time to let that happen. And transgenic, which means that there's DNA from multiple things like the Enviro pig. We would never be able to breed things together and create a pig that has a gene from a mouse in it and a gene from E. coli, right? That is definitely human engineering and creating transgenics. And the regulatory pathways in different countries are different for cisgenic versus transgenic. In the US, for example, plants that are engineered using cisgenic technologies, as in if it could have happened in nature, are not regulated. Um, but in the EU, there is a problem with anything that is genetically modified, regardless of how it got there, which is odd uh, because um, you would never know that you had a cisgenic plant growing in your field because there's no way to tell by looking at their genome that it's been genetically engineered. And it's, the, the argument there is that there might be unintended mutations that are introduced, right? That maybe when you're making these DNA edits, there's a mistake that happens. And I maybe that is true. Uh, mutations are not inherently dangerous. Um, all of us have mutations that our parents didn't have because there's one mistake in every one of our chromosomes on average whenever we're born. So we all have mutations that don't really do anything at all. And also in the EU, there's a long history of using something called mutation breeding to make new forms of things where you take stuff and you essentially zap it with radioactivity or with chemical mutagens that cause thousands of mutations to happen all at the same time. And then you look at the plants that develop and you say, oh, I like that one, I'll take that one. And that's how we got things like ruby red grapefruits and green and wheat. So those things are okay, perfectly normal, tens of thousands of uncharacterized new mutations, not dangerous and who cares, but tens and thousands of them there. But if there's the like mistake that, that might happen or this one intentional mutation, then that's somehow scary and dangerous. I think the problem is not that the technology is scary and dangerous, but that we don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And we don't, uh, and, and I don't fault anyone for not under, not for being a, a, afraid, nervous about things that they don't understand. And for this, I, I blame this like malicious group of people who are going around and spreading fake news about what genetically modified things are. Um, there's a whole different range of things and calling something GMO and another thing non-GMO is with the intention of giving consumers choice is just a fallacy. It's not true and it's, it's, it's unfair and it's stopping us from being able to really take advantage is stopping us from being able to take advantage of good things and from being able to be nervous about things that are genuinely scary that might slip by under the radar if we don't figure this out. You know, like anyway, I got lost there on a tangent. No, no, that was a great answer. And also, you actually answered um, Daniel's question, which was about to do with you know climate change and the speed at which we need to change things. Right, that could... was where I was going. Right, <laughs> that, that the reason that I'm technology. arguing that we need these technologies yeah. is because we cannot just allow evolution to try to make up for stuff. That is too slow. The pace of environmental change, our fault, is way too fast for that to happen. And if we are going to intervene and 
metal and manipulate species in order to survive in this crazy world, we need to be able to have access to technologies that allow us to make those changes at a pace that keeps up with the pace of climate change today. Mm, that's a fantastic answer. We're nearly out of time, Beth, but I want to ask one final question um, from one attendee who have, they've asked if um, you're going to make your book available on Audible with you as a narrator because they love your delivery and they'd love to hear your book in your voice. Yes, I am. I have already recorded it. I didn't record the last book and I listened to it a bit and I was so freaked out by somebody else reading my words written in first person that wasn't me that I, I wrote to, to the people in charge of this and I said, can I please be the narrator for my book? And they made me try out. I had to send an audio tape to them. And then I was nervous. I was like, what if I'm not good enough to narrate my own book? You know, I was freaked out about this, but luckily I got the job. Yeah. And so I did it. And I just finished doing the few outtakes last week. So I think it, it'll be released any time. Um, so yeah, and me narrating it. I don't know if I want to listen to it though. No one likes the sound of their own voice, right? Yeah, that's always a strange feeling. Um, <laughs> But you've been such a wonderful speaker. I've loved listening to you and I hope everyone else has enjoyed it. And I have to say a small plug, if anyone um, is interested, you mentioned The Chestnut Trees, which is the beginning of Richard Powers' this Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Overstory. It's all about chestnut trees. And we actually have him speaking tomorrow. So if you're interested, come and join. We've also had Jane Goodall this week. You can watch all of these on How To Plus or you can come and see him in person if you're in London. But look at the piggies. I know. The different piggies. <laughs> it's such a fantastic visual metaphor it's, it's a really great front cover i hope i hope you you told the team it was a great choice um but thank you all so much and thank you beth for such a wonderful talk i learned so much i had no idea that dodos came from were a type of pigeon they're a pigeon i'm obsessed with that fact i'm gonna tell everyone <laughs> um everyone thank you so much for joining us on your thursday evening morning afternoon wherever you are and Beth, good luck with the rest of your day and good luck with thank the rest you. of your book promotion. I'm sure it's going to do fantastically. But thank you, everyone, for joining and bye-bye from us at How To. Bye, Beth. Bye-bye. <laughs>